Hello everybody, this is KCSB FM in Santa Barbara 91.9. My name is Keon and you are listening to Meet Your Mentors, where we talk with faculty and staff here at UCSB about who they are, what they do, and what life at UCSB is all about. Today, I am pleased to have a wonderful professor on my show. He was a professor of mine just this past quarter, and uh, his name is Professor Doug Bradley. Thank you for being here. Hello, Keon. It's good to be here. It's good to have you here. Uh, so we have a lot to talk about today, and um, that's because you are such a uh, accomplished person. So I'm very much looking forward to uh, going through all that. But I just want to start with giving a little bit of background about yourself. Uh, so you went to Orange County College, or Orange Coast College, yes, which is very near my hometown of Irvine. Yes, coincidentally enough, very close. Uh, Orange County is a great place, uh, and. Also, coincidentally enough, you went to UCSB and got your Bachelor of Arts in Liberal Studies. I did. And Stanford for your Master's in Education. Yes. Three very uh, prestigious uh, institutions. And um, so you have said that you are not a typical UCSB academic. Uh, you worked as a technical writer, a project engineer, an electronics technician, served in the military on the U.S. Coast Guard. Uh, so my first question to you for the day is, uh, how did you find yourself working in such diverse places after getting uh, a liberal studies degree and education degree? I was working in industry for pretty much my whole life. Um, and I had writing talents, I suppose. I always loved to write. And my educational training supported that. And back in the early 90s, I was a local chapter president for uh, STC, Society for Technical Communication, which is the largest international organization for technical writers and illustrators. And I had taught high school for a couple years, and I was trained in education. And a lot of our membership locally were academics here at UCSB, and they asked me if I'd like to come over and be a guest lecturer. And I said, sure. And I did some guest lecturing. And then they, uh, given I had an educational background, they said, well, would you like to teach one class and see how it goes? And I said, sure. And it went very well. And and then they said, well, would you like to teach part-time? And I said, sure. And next thing I knew, I was teaching full-time, and I haven't looked back. So uh, you uh, slowly worked your way, but uh, you had uh, some technical classes in there. Uh, I did. I took some courses while I was at Orange Coast College, for example, in digital electronics, although most of my technical training really was self-taught. I would learn on the job, OJT. Yeah. Uh, yeah, which is still, I think, one of the very best ways to learn if you're in the presence of good mentors, speaking of mentors, people who are yes. eager and helpful at training you and, and showing you the ropes. And I was very fortunate to have a lot of wonderful people in my life who were able and willing to teach me an awful lot quickly. And I was always an eager student, so I, I enjoyed that a great deal. It was a wonderful trait to have, uh, especially for... Uh if you want to learn so many new things. Um, so um, how has your background informed the writing classes you teach at UCSB? You teach uh, Writing 50, which is for research, and then writing for various professions. Yeah, my right. focus area is STEM, science, tech, engineering, mathematics, and also uh, medicine. And um, so my, given that focus, uh, my background, I think, enables me in many respects to help students connect the dots with what they're learning here, at least in theoretical uh, form, and how that applies to the real world, how it actually works out there. And, and by the way, I hate the term the way real world is used around yeah. a university. This is a real world, too. And sometimes we get on our high horse about what the real world is. Yeah. But uh, college is a real world. And... Um, People in industry uh, leverage the knowledge they gain in college, and they also learn by fits and starts and trial and error. And I think that students have a great deal to learn by looking at what happens out there in industry and uh, applying their knowledge to the strange occurrences that, that were going to pop up in their path every step of the way when they get out in the working world. Um, so it's adaptive, I think. When you come from industry, you learn to adapt 
very quickly to realities. And you have to, certainly in the marketplace, if you don't adapt, your company folds. So you have to learn to very quickly adapt to things. So I think I'm helpful with my students. I hope I'm helpful at getting them to adapt quickly to things that are changing around them all the time. I can vouch for that. Yes, you are. Um, uh, so a little bit more about uh, your background. You have written a screenplay. I've written several screenplays. Several screenplays, mm -hmm. correct. Uh, a couple of which you've won awards for. Isn't that true? True. Um, and I just wanted to ask you about this one, Local Boys, that got made into a major motion picture. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, yeah. What's it about? Well, it's um, partly autobiographical. I grew up with a much older brother. He's almost nine years older than I. And he, uh, when we moved to California in 1969, uh, we quickly discovered the surf scene. We lived in Huntington Beach, also known oh, yeah. as Surf City. Yeah. And it was almost impossible as a young person to live there and not be exposed to surfing and the surf culture. So he was um, really like a second father to me. He used to take me every way with him and his friends. <clears throat> we would um, travel all around Southern California and they'd take me uh, on camping trips and all sorts of things. So I sort of started with that story and um, built out a, a story of two brothers who are in the midst of a personal family crisis and, and coming of age. And um, my uh, co-writer on that story, Tom Stewart, was a co-worker of mine at Digital Instruments where our, our boss was uh, Coincidentally, Virgil Ealing's, one of our halls here is named after Virgil. And uh, we wrote that uh, in the latter days of Digital Instruments, just before it was sold. And uh, we polished it up. We took it to the uh, film festival here in town, the Santa Barbara Film Festival, and we surprised ourselves by winning second place in the screenwriting contest, which made it much easier to get it into the hands of producers and directors. And we finally did find a director and producers who were interested, and they, and they funded it, and they uh, made the film. Then just two, year, two years later, it was released again at the film festival uh, as a feature film. I think it was one of the last films Mark Harmon did before he got uh, into his NCIS days. So. That's so cool. Yeah. And before we get to our break, um where we'll have a song for you. Um, I just wanted to talk about how when you were an undergrad at UCSB, you were a co-manager of a record store on Embarcadero del Norte and Pardal, basically like the hub of Isla Vista, which is so cool. I mean, that intersection is like so vital to IV. And um, I was wondering what uh, your experience was there and maybe uh, your take on the 80s music scene. First of all, I don't think Isla Vista has changed all that much. Yeah. <laughs> it's when I walk out into Isla Vista today, it looks very little changed from those years. If you go to the um, uh, south part of the loop where there's a lot of new construction, uh, there are some high rise apartment buildings, for example, that did not exist back in those days. But I think culturally, Isla Vista is pretty similar to the way it was in the 80s. There's a lot going on all the time. Um, the 80s, I mean, I could go on. I, we could do a whole program about 80s music. But one of the things that's kind of fun about the 80s is that it was a period of um, sort of creative coming out for a lot of artists. It was also the perfect storm where analog was giving way to digital. And, of course, as you know, anytime you change the technology radically, the arts will change. And so artists were uh, beginning to experiment with a lot more specific editing processes, for example. Of course, the instruments, the synthesizers that were developed in the 80s were changing the sound and the performance of music. So uh, a lot of artists also that had cut their teeth in the 60s and 70s broke out of the bands that they were in. Then you think about like Phil Collins coming out of Genesis and Adrian Ballou, who'd been uh, playing for Talking Heads, going out and doing his own stuff. Uh, a lot of experimentation, and even some of the far fringe stuff like Laurie Anderson and Meredith Monk, uh, who were sort of channeling the ghost of Patti Smith and other female innovators before them, uh, doing some really radical stuff with music and performance art. So very exciting, creative time. And I think uh, it's worth looking at, given the political age that we're about to enter again. It, it, I'm having flashbacks of the Reagan era, really. Yeah. 
And I think one of the things that happens in periods politically like that is the arts will uh, react to that. And it may give rise, I hope it gives rise again to another powerful creative outburst in the arts. That'd be cool. Mm-hmm. Some uh, some new music for uh, combating this interesting time that we have. Um, so yeah, that's uh, uh, the first part of our show. That'll wrap up the first third, I guess. Uh, we're going to have a, a song for you right now, East of Eden by Jack Temchin. This is uh, on your one of the songs on your list of favorites. Um, so we're going to have that, and we'll be right back here on Meet Your Mentors uh, with Professor Doug Bradley. This time we kept our dream Nothing ever came between Finally we're standing at the gate Ah, oh, but the gate is closed There's a wall Never thought it would be so tall Just a piece of paper seals your face Hey everyone, we're back. This is KCSB FM in Santa Barbara, 91.9. Meet Your Mentors is the show you're listening to. I'm Keon, and we are here with Professor Doug Bradley of the UCSB Writing Department, and we have been talking about uh, some of his uh, achievements and uh, some of the things he has done. And um, right now, we're going into a little bit of current affairs 
Um, and the first current affair I want to talk about is this fake news phenomena. And um, I was wondering, what is it and why has it come about? Fake news is a relatively new term. I frankly didn't see it at all until about the election. I think it's simply a new word or new term for disinformation or lies, which I prefer because they cut to the chase. Um, But I think uh, one of the dangers of calling it fake news is it sort of normalizes it in a way. Uh, Like it's just news, but it's not very good news. Well, actually, fake news, when you cut to its core, really is a form of disinformation. It's often um, crafted in order to influence people in deleterious ways. So um, I teach a course here in the Writing 50 sequence. We always have a kind of topical focus, and my topical focus, as you know, is Mm -hmm. urban legends, conspiracy narratives, and hoaxes. And the issue of fake news fits very comfortably into this rubric. Definitely. So you have a game, I um, am aware? I do. What I've done (laughs) is I, in the run-up to the recent election, I probably uh, snapshotted several hundred headlines because I wanted to analyze this. I knew I was going to, it was like watching a comet come by. I better get all the (laughs) photos I can and I can analyze them later downstream. And a lot of these have since vanished actually from these websites. So you got to get them while you can. I'm going to read you a series of headlines. And some of these are fake news headlines. All of, all of these uh, have come off the internet Uh, various sources, and I can tell you where they came from. And I've intermixed into them what we'll call fake, fake news. I've just made them up. And I want to see if you can tell the difference. So uh, we're going to do a send-up of the NPR game, Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. We're going to call this Wait, Wait, Don't Fake Me. So uh, tell me if it's fake news or fake, fake news. Okay. All right. You ready? Yeah. All right. So first one is um, Hillary supporters burn American flag riot threatened to kill Trump after losing election. Death threats against president-elect explode on social media. Fake, fake. No, that's an actual uh, real headline from InfoWars the day after the election. Um, Let's try another one. I think you can do better than this. Socialist protest against president-elect Trump. Trump's victory sparks far-left protests. Death threats across the country. Fake. Fake. Yes, that was uh, circulated yes. again on InfoWars. So you're one and one. You're not doing too bad. One one. Uh, Clinton State Department hired terrorists for security in Benghazi. Hired terrorists for security in Benghazi. Fake. Yes, it is. It's a actual headline that ran on Election Day. Uh, again, from InfoWars. InfoWars, man. Yeah. Fake news all over that website. <laughs> yeah, Alex Jones, I think we could argue, is the master of fake news. And uh, he's been up to this sort of mischief for a very long time. Email links show Hillary Clinton associates, uh, associates engaging in Wiccan rituals. Email links. Fake. No, that's fake, fake. Fake, fake. Yes. That's one of yours. That's uh, actually, my wife wrote that one up this morning while I made pancakes. Wow. Yeah, she's good at this. Very good. She's an artist, so yeah. she's very creative in her own mind, uh, in her own right. So, um, spirit cooking, Clinton campaign chairman practices bizarre occult ritual, menstrual blood, semen, and breast milk, most bizarre WikiLeaks revelation yet. Uh, hmm. <laughs> That was quite a headline. I'm going to go fake news. Yes, that's an actual headline um, that came out just four days before the election. Yeah, I think we know how crazy these headlines can be and how it's hard to tell, too, you know, whether it's trustworthy or not. Yeah, and there lies the rub, of course, is um, I think your generation, particularly millennials, have never had such a burden of the, uh, being able to filter out information and being able to discern quickly and efficiently whether something is completely conjured up mm-hmm. or has uh, is actual real life and it's just a bizarre facet of real life. Um, 
And it's not going to get any easier. I think that one of my jobs as an educator here is to help students navigate these kinds of spaces quickly. And there are some old techniques that uh, are useful and some new research that speaks to this. And so I try to stay on top of that and share this with my students. And they find things, too, they send me that are really helpful. With Facebook and Twitter, there's so much news stories that come through your feed. 34% of Americans currently get their news. news stories off of social media. It's unbelievable. And I look through all of these things and I see, you know, new invention for cutting your tomatoes perfectly. New, you know, document came out saying this person did this crazy thing. And it's, you know, I hesitate to share anything on my Facebook feed because... I feel like almost everything is, you know, too good to be true on all these headlines. Yeah, yeah. There was a very informative study that was just um, completed last, uh, end of last summer, early fall, at Stanford University. The Stanford History Education Group, SHEG, uh, released a study, and they have a wonderful executive summary that's well worth reading. And they were testing students from junior high through high school and into college to see if they could tell the difference between actual news stories and, for example, advertisements. And they found that even among well-prepared and educated students, they had a very hard time telling the difference uh, because we have sort of fallen down the rabbit hole and we're in this state of informational freefall where um, oftentimes students, if they use traditional reading techniques, they are not able to tell the difference. Or they may conflate the two in various ways that um, render the stories kind of meaningless in their lives. So one of the things they did is they divided audiences into two groups. They said, you know, we have what we'll call vertical readers and we have horizontal readers. So a vertical reader is someone who kind of starts at the top, reads on down through the article until they either lose interest or... Um, or they glean what they think they need to know from it. And then they'll come up with a deliberation, they'll decide if it's real or not, or how real it is. And then we have what they call horizontal readers. These are people who, uh, maybe within the first paragraph or so, they're already um, going outside the article and they're starting to look things up. They, they look across and they wanna know, like, who's this author? What, what else have they written? Are they reputable? Do they have a history of um, honest, uh, well-informed news, or are they, you know, or, or maybe that's a, a pseudonym for someone doesn't even exist. And they'll also check on facts that they encounter along the way or things reported as facts to see if they line up with what they can find elsewhere and sort of triangulate in on the truth. So one of the strategies I'm trying to encourage my students to do is more of this horizontal reading where they uh, don't be too quick to, you know, trust your own internal guidance to figuring out whether this is real or not. But you know, look around and see if it makes sense. Triangulate from multiple sources to see if the story uh, really uh, carries um, a sense of realism to it, or if it's just made up and fun. You know, maybe it's just for entertainment. And mm -hmm. some of the stories are, and we shouldn't perhaps take them too seriously. I mean, we do have things like Mother Jones and such. Uh, the onion.com yeah. that, that publish things. We know they're fake, and we just read them because they're fun they're to fun. read. Yeah. Yeah, so maybe a horizontal reading strategy is a good thing to adopt in this age of information. Um, so we're going to have our, uh, another break, and we're going to come back and uh, talk a little about uh, maybe your advice to students. And um, so, yeah, this next song is going to be A Perfect Day, Elise by PJ Harvey. Uh, again, this is Meet Your Mentors. We'll be right back after this.
Hey everyone, welcome back. We are here with Professor Doug Bradley from the UCSB Writing Department. And uh, we've been talking a lot about current affairs, uh, his background, and now we're going to have um, our last portion of the show. Uh, so Professor, do you have any uh, advice to students here at UCSB? Read books. I would like to follow up our last discussion about fake news with, yes. I wish students would read more books. Um, to make a book, to build a book, requires a different dynamic than what we see online. And I think that when you go to a bookstore, and you know, you can go to any thrift shop these days uh, or use bookshop and get books fairly cheaply. Um, I think that would be a, a helpful practice. I always tell my students who want to improve their writing that my first prescription of choice is always just read more and internalize what you read. Go for the good stuff. Find things that are um, informative about things that you're curious about and want to know more about. And, and try to internalize, particularly with good writers, the phraseologies that they use, their choice of words, their diction. And... Um, also, think carefully about those ideas. One of the wonderful things about books, besides being such wonderful companions, is that they give us the ability to reflect on what we're thinking, you know, what we're reading and what the author is intending to say to us in ways that um, I think are different than what we get online. Uh, there's nothing wrong with getting information online. I certainly get an awful lot of information online. Uh, particularly the news. That's where I usually go to get the news. I have a subscription to Washington Post, and I like to read the news. But I still find books to be one of my most reliable source of friendship. Uh, you know, uh, more advice? I'd say go camping. Go camping. Go camping. Camping's fun. Yeah, it really ke it recalibrates your senses. It recalibrates your sense of time and space. And it's a lot of fun to go camping with friends. And it sort of reifies the world in ways that I think are very healthy and therapeutic for us. Yeah, great advice. Um, yesterday was MLK Day. Um, and I was wondering uh, if you could talk about that. You, um, your grandparents knew the man. Yes, my maternal grandfather, uh, Clyde Sharp, he was a... Uh, HVAC man, that is heating, ventilation, air conditioning. And he had in his earlier days his own metal shop. He had to make his own ducting and um, he would service f furnaces and air conditioners and whatnot. And one of his clients uh, was Martin Luther King Sr. and his church downtown Atlanta. Uh, all of my relatives are from Atlanta. And um, I lived there as a child. And when we moved west, I began to lose touch with most of my relatives there. But uh, yeah, he, uh, he knew his father and he knew Martin Luther King Jr. as well. And um, what was his take on Martin Luther King Jr.? Well, you have to remember my grandfather was a product of his times. Right. And he, uh, he really liked his father. He liked, he really, uh, I think uh, from what I've heard second hand through the family. He really admired and liked his father. He was, I think, a lot more reserved about his son because of his political activism at the time. And being a, uh, a very staid uh, white Southerner, I think he was not comfortable with uh, Martin Luther King's uh, progress in civil rights. And it's kind of ironic that you know, here we are two generations later. And, and for me, Martin Luther King is certainly one of my Heroes, yeah, absolutely. In fact, I uh, the day before MLK Day, I I reread Letter from Birmingham Jail. I think that is should be required reading in the United States. It is so relevant today to our lives, and particularly what's going on right now in the Black Lives Matters movement, and and uh, trying to institute reforms in law enforcement around the country with the way law enforcement deals with African Americans. Um, it's a wonderful bit of prose, well worth reading. Reading, a good book that you may want to pick up on your uh, way back home today. Um, well, that about wraps up our show, I think. Um, 
So I want to thank you again, Professor, for coming on. It was a real pleasure talking to you and um, uh, sharing with me also your music taste. Um, so this next song is going to be Everything That Touches You by The Association. Uh, and thanks again for being on the show. Thanks so much, Kian. I'm spending those moments